Hi, everybody. Welcome to Cooks Without Borders' very first Q&A with um, an incredibly interesting person in the, in the food world. I'm here with Sarah Leung from, from the Walks of Life, which is one of my absolute favorite websites, besides Cooks Without Borders, of course. <laughs> But no, I love I love Sarah's site, which um, she has with her family, and it's um, it's just super cool. It's a great place to get lost in. Um, I'm sure nobody finds themselves with any extra time on their hands during COVID or anything like that, where they just want to like find something interesting to read online. But um, in case you find yourself in that situation, definitely jump onto the Walks of Life if you haven't already. But here is Sarah and um, she'll give you a good introduction to it. Some of you I'm sure already have taken a spin through it. So I would like to introduce Sarah. Um, Hi everyone. Thank you, uh, Leslie, for that intro. Um, yeah, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, Super excited to do this. This is my first ever like live uh, streamed interview. So this is very exciting. Um, but yeah, as Leslie mentioned, um, I run a food blog with uh, my family called The Walks of Life. And so that's my parents and my sister. Um, had to clarify that because people are like, what do you mean your family? Like your parents? <laughs> and um, yes, it is my parents uh, and my sister. and. Um, yeah, we, we started the blog in 2013 as a way to basically stay connected. My parents had had just moved to Beijing um, and my sister and I were still in college. And we realized that year of being in school with my parents abroad that we were really weren't eating a lot of the dishes that we grew up with. Um, and it was because we didn't know how to make them. Um, my sister and I grew up cooking. We love food. Our whole family loves food, obviously. Um, but when it came to those traditional Chinese dishes, um, you know, we kind of left it to the, the older generation and never really took the time to like stand and watch and see what they were doing. Um, and so we decided to start the blog as a way to record those recipes um, because, you know, for, for us, we, for us, the younger generation, we didn't want those recipes to get lost um, in time. So, um, so yeah, we started the blog together and, uh, it's been going ever since for the last seven or eight years or so. Okay, great. So that's, so you, so that was with your sister, Caitlin and were the two of you, um, living together at the time? So when I actually started the blog, um, we kind of like, were fomenting the ideas, uh, for it in, like I said, in, in my last year of college and her first year of college, she's three years behind me. Um, but when we actually started the blog, I was living in my parents' house <laughs> by myself. Um, I had just graduated from school and my parents were living in Beijing and my sister was also uh, still in school. So oh. we were we were in three separate places. Yeah. Um, and the blog kind of, you know, became this project that we all connected over and w worked on as we were, you know, in our different worlds, so to speak. Yeah. So, so your parents' house is in New Jersey, right? And, and your sister was in school at the University of Pennsylvania. So was she, maybe she was coming home sometimes occasionally. Yeah. Um, and you, yeah, maybe, exactly. So what were some of the dishes in those days that you were like, oh my God, I wish mom and dad were here to make, you know, X or Y, like, what are the things that you most missed in the beginning? Yeah, um, I think it's it's funny because a lot of those recipes um, were the earliest recipes that we published. Um, and we've been kind of going back through them and trying to like revive them and bring them into today because because they're so old, they, they don't get uh, the most attention. But um, one of my absolute favorites that I always requested, like anytime we had family over a special occasion was uh, my dad's roasted chicken with sticky rice. Um, which is basically like a, an almost like easy casserole version of a more traditional dish of a boneless whole stuffed chicken uh, with sticky rice in it, which is, I've never tried deboning an entire chicken, <laughs> uh, but I imagine it's not super easy. So um, it was actually my aunt who came up with the idea of using chicken thighs uh, and she would just debone skin on chicken thighs and then take a ball of sticky rice, put the chicken thigh on top and then lay them in like a, a casserole dish. And it worked great. It's like one of my and my cousin's favorite 
uh, recipes. And that was the one, like for me selfishly, that was the one recipe that I started the blog for, to be honest. Um, like that was the one that I wanted recorded. Yeah. Um, and then also just dishes that my mom made um, on weeknights growing up. Um, her her braised pork belly, her Shanghai braised pork belly is one of our favorites. Um, various like just regular sort of everyday like tofu stir fries, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think as the blog has evolved, we have moved farther into, um, you know, restaurant style dishes, Chinese takeout style dishes, um, or like regional, like traditional regional cooking. But we started the blog really to record those like Shanghainese and Cantonese like home cooked dishes that my parents uh, made for us growing up. I see. So tell me, um, tell us about your um, your parents. Your mom is from Shanghai, right? She, she was yes. born there? Yeah, my mom was born uh, in Shanghai and she came to the US when she was 16. Um, and then my dad actually is first generation American born Chinese. He uh, grew up in upstate New York in the Catskills. And uh, and yes, they, they met there. It's actually a, it's a cool story. My, um, my parents met basically because my, my mother's grandmother uh, was here already in the US and friends with my dad's mother. Um, and they worked in the same hotel. Uh, and so when my parents came over, uh, my dad's family kind of helped my mom's family settle in um, to um, like life in America. Um, like my parents tell this funny story of like how my dad like gave my mom's cousin like his hand-me-down sweaters and like, it's just like their families were kind of connected um, mm -hmm. when when my mom's family immigrated here, and that's how my parents met. Um, so that is, that is a cool story. Wait, so you're so and your and your dad worked. In, his family had had a Chinese restaurant. Is that is that right? They did. So they they eventually opened a Chinese restaurant. Um, but in those early days, when my dad was uh, when my dad was still a kid. Uh, they worked um, for resorts and hotels in the in the, the Catskills, and um, my grandpa worked as a chef, and uh, he worked in hotels like um, Grossinger's and like the Holiday Inn. And those hotels were primarily serv serving Jewish clientele from New York City, and um, they all had like kind of like an American side of the menu and a Chinese menu uh, where they were also serving sort of American Chinese takeout fare. Um, and and that's kind of, that's where my grandfather sort of um, worked for many years until he was eventually able to open his own restaurant. And also where my dad kind of like cut his teeth in a, a, like a professional kitchen setting when he was a, a teenager. And, and so when once he opened that restaurant, um, your grandfather opened that restaurant, what was the restaurant like? So it was in a pretty rough neighborhood. It was in Orange, New Jersey, um, which was, you know, like, a, I guess, considered like inner city at the time. Um, I actually haven't been to Orange since, I don't know, in many years, but um, it was a, it was actually a sit down restaurant. You could sit down, there were tables, um, but it like majority of the business was con that was conducted was like takeout business. Um, and it was called Sun Hing. And we actually have one of the old, we, my dad actually just recently um, uncovered one of the old menus, which was like incredible to see. Cause I didn't realize that we still had any of those. Um, but it served, you know, the restaurant served a lot of the, those like Chinese takeout favorites that we all know, as well as some of the sort of more retro dishes that I think have gone a little bit out of style um, over the years. And that maybe people aren't as aware of today. Um, things like fantail shrimp or like butterfly shrimp with bacon, like things like that, that I don't think you see too often these days, but that, you know, people ordering takeout food in the 80s and 90s or earlier probably remember. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, um, I I was pretty young. 
uh, when my grandparents were still running the restaurant. Um, it was probably like the first five years or so of my life that I like was ever in there. I don't, so I don't like have a huge memory of it, but there are pictures of me in the restaurant. That's so cool. um, yeah. That's so it. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to interrupt for one second to say that I just had a note that there's a little, that the video is a little glitchy. Um, um, maybe is anybody having, maybe um, anybody who's having a problem. Oh, so now somebody says it's okay. You're back. You're very, you're a little pixelated for me. If anybody's having video problems, maybe you could just drop in a, in a comment. And then I should also probably um, have, have said um, as well as I should have thanked everybody for being here, which Sarah did for me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, but, but also just to say that first we're going to talk just a little, you know, we'll talk a little bit, the, the last part um, will be for, we'll, we'll get to your questions, but I think I'll also grab a bunch of, you know, grab questions here and there throughout as well, because I see that there are five questions that people have asked. Um, meanwhile, we have two polls. One of them is about whether you own a wok, and another is about the kind of Chinese cooking that you're most interested in. So if if you guys want to take a second and answer the poll about the walk, um, I'd love to sort of ask Sarah um, some questions about walks because it's, you know, such a, it's such a, a, you know, sort of key starting point for people starting to cook Chinese food. Um, so um, if you guys wouldn't mind answering that poll right now, I think we have, um, do you own a walk? Two people have said yes and three people have said no. The other option is no, but I'm considering buying one. So, okay, so we have, you know, some yes, some no. Um, why don't, um, Sarah, can you can you talk about that? One of the things that I really love about the walks of life is that it's it really demystifies the whole like experience of buying a walk and seasoning it and taking care of it, which is like, are we doing this right? It's like the cast iron pan thing. Like, are you allowed to wash it? Like, what do we do? Can you um, tell us, first of all, like, What's the first, like, how would you go about thinking about this if you've never owned a walk before and you want to, then you want to buy one? How do you, what should people think about? Sure. So I think um, the first thing to decide is what shape your walk should be, whether it's a round bottom or a flat bottom. And that depends largely on the type of stove you have. So if you have um, a gas burner, I would highly recommend the flat bottomed wok, um, which is the traditional, the, the more traditional shape, um, which you can use with like a wok ring directly on uh, your gas range. Um, however, if you have like a, an electric stove that has either coils or just like a, an induction um, stove or, or just one of those electric ones that just heats up underneath, um, then you would be looking at like a walk ring with, with a round bottom walk obviously wouldn't work. So you would have to invest in a flat bottomed walk. Okay. Um, I'm you said for gas, you flat bottom, but I think you, I think you meant. Oh, round sorry. Bottom. I meant round bottom. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I misspoke there. Um, a round bottom with a walk ring on gas or a flat bottom on electric. Um, and and then uh, the next thing to think about is uh, the material the wok is made out of. So they, they make woks that are nonstick, cast iron, stainless steel, carbon steel. Uh, and the best of that is, is definitely carbon steel. Um, because it's so thin and because uh, it heats up quickly and retains that heat quickly, um, and also because it seasons uh, like a cast iron pan would. So it seasons, it, it, you get that like nonstick patina on it, uh, that's going to make it easier to cook things like noodles or rice in, in the wok um, or any other stir fry really. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think uh, the other thing to consider is whether or not it has handles. Uh, the best, like an ideal wok is going to have a handle on like the actual long handle as well as the little um, the little handle on the other sides, so allowing you to kind of pick it up and maneuver it. Um, ideally, the handle is wooden, uh, so it doesn't conduct heat because that thing gets very, very hot and you want to be able to actually hold and use the handle without having to like mess around with oven mitts or like a towel or something like that. Um, 
In fact, we have a walk that like uh, an older style walk that has a metal handle and my dad grabbed it with like a kitchen towel once and like it lit on fire. So like, you don't want to do, you don't want that to happen. Um, so um, a wooden handle and then you want to also make sure that that walk has a lid um, so that if you're brazing um, with it or you're steaming with it, you can use that lid. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, the reason why um, those other walk materials don't aren't as ideal. Um, so for cast iron, it's super heavy. Um, and while it does, it can get super hot, it uh, takes a longer time to heat up. Um, and when it comes to uh, stainless steel, you're just not gonna ever get like that nonstick cooking surface with stainless steel. Um, and then when it comes to nonstick, the ideal wok cooking temperature is like searing hot and nonstick coatings usually have like a heat, like an upper limit on how, uh, how hot you can heat them up um, before it becomes like unsafe or before they start leaching chemicals. So uh, we never recommend using um, a nonstick wok. So. Okay. So if I have, I have a carbon steel one, but I bought it years ago when I only had a, um, an electric stove. So it's flat bottom. Do you think in, in a case like mine, is it worth buying a new one? Should I, should I buy a round bottom one? Um, I think that if the flat bottom one has been working for you, I don't think there's any reason to replace it, but I would say that um, the round bottom is just slightly more ideal because it's, it's like perfectly sloped, which makes it, um, you know, if you're using a bamboo steamer in it, it, it makes it more ideal for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the, the actual, um, just like the way that the heat is distributed in the pan is like a little bit more even. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I'm convinced I'm going to get one. Where do you, <laughs> what's a good place? Do you, is there a place you recommend to buy a walk? So we actually purchased our walk over the years from restaurant supply stores um, here in New York City, uh, usually like run by Chinese people. In the Bowery. Um, <laughs> by Don Bowery, who supply um, Chinese restaurants. Um, but I, I think that there are several uh, restaurant supply companies that have like online ordering. I, I don't know of any in particular, but um, I'm sure that, you know, a quick Google search might yield, um, you know, something like that where you can find sort of a no frills um a no frills uh carbon steel walk uh from from a restaurant supplier if not um you know most of the i think the big kitchen retailers have kind of caught on to the fact that carbon steel is like carbon steel pans i'm noticing are a lot more popular like for actual just frying pans are becoming more popular um so I think when it comes to walk buying, most of the walks in the market that I'm seeing anyway are carbon steel. Um, okay, just a couple more things related to walks and then we'll move on. But um, so I know that on your site, you have a really good, it's, it's, it's actually pretty easy to season a walk. It's not a big deal. And then there's something super cool um, about how to not have your, like, oh, you know, first of all, you do wash it, right? You like, mm -hmm. yes. like there's this idea out there that you're not supposed to put water on it, but that's wrong. There is, which is very silly, um, <laughs> which is fair. But, I mean, it's fair because I, I've heard the same thing about cast iron as well. Um, you know, you don't want it to rust. You don't want like, and it's true that you do, after you wash the wok, you do have to make sure that it is bone dry um, before you put it away or it might rust. And the way to do that way that we normally do that is um, I wash it, I give it a quick wipe, and then I'll put it on the stove and heat it um, so that all of that water evaporates. Um, and then I'll just leave it on the stove, let it cool, and then put it away. Um, do you, do you, that, do you give it a little wipe of um, oil ever? So my dad recommends that. Um, and it, it is a good idea if your wok is new. Um, but if your walk is like several is like years old and you, you use it as often as we do, I, I don't think it's super necessary every single time. Once it's, once you've got that patina, uh, you don't have to oil it every single time you wash it. So what's the trick on, uh, that's on your site about 
about the super easy way to make sure nothing sticks in your walk. Yes, this is like, um, it's like a pretty crazily simple, but very effective trick. Um, and I know that a lot of people get frustrated with wok cooking, because, especially with things like noodles or with fried rice, because it seems like everything is just like sticking and you can't stir it. And it just ends up becoming this like sticky, soggy mess. Um, the secret to avoiding that is heating the wok first before you add oil. So the reason why that works, and this is how my mom explains it on the blog, is that basically you are, by heating the wok first, you are heating off any moisture, residual moisture that might be on the surface of that wok. And then when you add cold oil to it, it just creates this like slippery, nonstick surface. Um, and as long as you heat it, like, so when I say heat, I mean like, the wok should be like lightly smoking. Okay. Um, and then you can add that oil, swirl it around and anything you put in there, even like a, like you could try it with like, to really put it to the test, take a block of like firm tofu, which is like super wet and like super delicate and you think it would never work, but you just slide it into that, the wok after you've given it that treatment and it'll just like slip slide all around and like will not stick. Um, so that method really, really works. Okay, so Juliet is asking, what prevents the oil from burning? So that uh, that is more of like a question of what kind of oil you're using. So you wanna make sure that you're using a high smoke point oil. Um, the oil that's best for stir frying with the highest possible smoke point, at least to my knowledge, is avocado oil. Um, and that's actually what I've been using and I, I really like using it. I think it's smoke, it has a smoke point of like 500 degrees or something like that, yeah. um, 490, something in that range. Um, and, but as long as you're using a, a relatively high smoke point oil, like even like vegetable or canola oil uh, can get pretty hot. Um, that's kind of it. You just make sure that you use um, an oil like that. And then right when, you, right after you add the oil, you begin to add the ingredients. So that basically wok cooking is all about like temperature regulation. Um, you know that as you, you're adding ingredients, the temperature of the wok is going down, right? It's cooling off uh, from adding those ingredients. Uh, and then, you know, when you want to, the wok to heat back up, uh, to generate that like wok hay or that breath of a wok flavor or that very elusive flavor. Um, you know, you, you want to give the wok a chance to, to really heat back up. Um, and so for, if you're cooking like leafy greens, for example, uh, my dad's method of doing that is basically he'll do the first initial stir fry to wilt the greens and then he will pile them all in the very center of the wok so that they're in this like protected little area while the sides of the wok heat up. And then as the sides of the wok begin to smoke, he'll like swirl the vegetables around the, those super yeah. heated sides of the wok to create that wok hay flavor without burning the vegetables. That's so, that is so cool. Is that, yeah, and I was gonna ask you about, so it sounds like it is possible if you know what you're doing and maybe have some practice or some cool techniques like that to get that wok hay at home. I, I didn't know if that was more like a restauranty thing or if if most Chinese home cooks like go for that and are able to like are you are you able to do that? Can you get the wok hay? So yes. Uh and I think that the key to that is is techniques like I just mentioned, but mostly the easiest way to get that at home is cooking in smaller batches. Because your stove, your home stove is going to be pretty limited in terms of how much heat it can really put out. Um, and so the one thing you can control is how much food you put in the wok. Um, so the, the less you put in there, the less you're cooling down the surface of, of the wok. So, um, so what I, t well, me, it's just me and my partner here. So we, uh, we cook in relatively small batches. Um, and so for things like, vegetable like greens which tastes extra delicious when you have that like wok hay flavor if we have like quite a bit to cook uh i'll cook it in two batches um mm. like i'll cook one batch 
and then we'll eat it and it'll be delicious. And then I'll just cook the other one um, real quick. Cause it, I mean, wok cooking is very fast. It, it, it can take like two, three minutes to, to complete a dish um, depending on what it is. And so it's, I think it's, it's a bit easier to, to conceive of cooking in multiple batches. Um, and, and yeah, it, it really does make, make a difference um, because if you're cooking, like for eight people in a 14 inch wok, you're never going to get that, that flavor just because you're adding too many ingredients and cooling down the wok too much. And it can never really get back up to temperature. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm just looking at the questions that people have dropped in. And the first one is also wok related. So let's, let's address that one. Um, can a paella, a paellera be used as a wok? So that would be a paella pan, which is a very shallow um, pan. So I think um, I would probably say no. <laughs> um, in my, we have one of, uh, we have a paella pan at home and I, I have used it before to make paella. Um, I think the problem with it is that it is very wide, which means that you're not gonna get that constant. The reason why the wok is sloped is uh, basically so that the heat can reach like all, parts of that wok and heat it evenly. Um, and so because the, the paella pan is so wide and large, you're gonna get like one small sort of concentrated area of heat in the middle and then the sides are never gonna get, mm -hmm. you know, quite as hot. Um, I think also the fact that it is shallow um, is gonna make it more difficult to execute on certain recipes that uh, you might wanna make in a wok braises or anything like that. Um, I would say if you don't have a wok, the next best thing is um, a really good frying pan um, or a cast iron pan. Uh, cast iron, you can get super, super hot um, with like, safely. So um, that's what makes it uh, a good alternative, I think, to just a regular wok. So, and maybe somebody just getting into this and maybe start out with a cast iron pan if you have one. And then if you love making this kind of food, then buy a wok. Would that be right. reasonable advice? Right. Yep, for sure. So, okay, so here's another question and it kind of getting away from like technical cooking stuff into something a little more cultural. Um, when you see generic quote unquote Chinese takeout menus, do those, do those dishes come from specific regions in China? And why do you think those are the ones that have become staples in this country? That is a great question. Yes. It's a so, big <laughs> it is a big question. So most of the, so those Chinese American dishes um, were mostly developed by cooks who came with the first sort of immigrant wave um, into the US. And most of those immigrants were from Southern China. Um, so uh, that's like Cantonese and then uh, Fujianese Chinese. Um, and that's really the cuisine that sort of influenced uh, what we all know as Chinese American takeout food. Um, and I mean, you, you'll have things like on a menu that say like Hunan or Sichuan. And I find that, so Hunan cuisine and Sichuan cuisine are both characterized by like chilies, spicy, like they're spicy. Um, they're spicy in different ways, uh, but so on a, on a Chinese American takeout menu, if you see like Szechuan shrimp or something, it probably means it just has, it has some chilies in it um, pretty much, or like Hunan beef has like peppers in it. Um, but for the most part, um, they're really like over those sort of characteristics of dishes that have those monikers attached to them have are really super like simplified or boiled down. They don't they don't really reflect uh, the that cuisine. So like Szechuan Szechuan cuisine is its own like super unique um, uh, cuisine, and it you'll you won't find anything resembling something that is authentically Szechuan on a Chinese takeout menu. Um, but I think that the the style of of Chinese American takeout cooking where you have like say like a beef with broccoli that has 
you know, a sauce with like a brown sauce that includes like oyster sauce and a little bit of garlic and a little bit of ginger. That kind of cooking is characteristic of like a Cantonese background, mm -hmm. um, like pretty simple flavors, oyster sauce, um, and like a kind of like not really like super strongly flavored anything so that you can taste the ingredients underneath. You can taste the broccoli, you can taste the beef. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I think that that's, that's a great question. Um, but it's really about those immigrants who came over in that first wave um, or the first waves. Um, and like, you know, if you think about Chinatown in New York City um, and the older generation that lives in Chinatown in New York City, like Manhattan Chinatown, um, most of those elders are, they speak Cantonese. Uh, they're from uh, Southern China. And then when you go over to Flushing, um, in Queens, you have a much more diverse set of Chinese immigrants coming from all over. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think of like Chinese takeout food, I think of it's, it's that Manhattan Chinatown generation that kind mm -hmm. of like. Yeah. And then in Los Angeles, that would be like downtown LA, Chinatown would be that old wave of um, Cantonese immigration. And then out in the San Gabriel Valley, you have the newer waves that would be sort of analogous to Flushing. Right. So, um, yeah. So when you talk about the first wave is the first wave would be when Chinese workers who were almost entirely male were brought over mm -hmm. to build the railroads. Right. So that that's like 19th century. That's like, right. Right. And then and then because I think that from what I understand and I've actually read quite a bit and written some about it um, is that there was that big wave. And then not another big wave until the Immigration Act of 1965 um, opened right. up. And, th and that started all of this newer immigration that is, is from, you know, a much wider swath of regions around China. Um, we have another, oh God, I'm, these questions are so great. So thank you everybody for them. Um, um, we have a question. Is there an easy way to make Zhao Long Bao at home? An easy way. Maybe, maybe it's two questions. Is there an easy way? And then is there any way? <laughs> so um, at first, we should probably say what they are. Yes. So Zhao Long Bao are, um, it literally translates to like small basket bun. And it basically refers to the fact that the dumplings are steamed in like bamboo baskets. Um, they are a, uh, a Shanghai specialty and they are basically a very thinly wrapped dumpling. Where it's what inside, we call soup dumplings, right? It's yes, what, it's what, it's what we call soup dumplings. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so it is, it is a pork filling um, with delicious hot soup in the middle, somehow wrapped in this impossibly thin wrapper. Um, and when done right, it is my favorite food. Honestly. Oh, wow. Does your well, so your mom is from Shanghai. Does she make really good ones? So my mom is from Shanghai. She makes, she makes a pretty decent version. Yes. Uh, but I have had probably like best in the world. Um, so my, my bar is very high. <laughs> um, but, uh, so my, my answer to that question is yes, it is possible to make them at home. It is very challenging. It's not like the easiest recipe to make. So basically how you have to, how it works is um, you, you make an aspic, which is something that I don't think many cooks these days do regularly. Um, a lot of haven't even younger, younger cooks haven't even heard of aspic. aspic. So right. what, what is aspic? So aspic is a, a, gelatinized stock basically it is uh it's meat jello is what i how i describe yeah. it um but it's it's like if you basically made a, a a pork stock in this case um and the bones and the sort of cartilage in in the meat or the bones that you use have enough gelatin in it to gelatinize that stock when it's chilled um and so that's what you have to do. You have to essentially make a stock. You have to chill it so that it can have time to like form that jello. Then you, uh, you slice 
you cut it, the jello, into chunks, and then you mix it into the pork filling. Um, wow. The filling is, is pretty wet, so it's, it's like not the easiest filling to work with. And then you have the wrapper, which is very thin. Um, and then there's like a special way to fold it. Um, I think the minimum like standard is like 18 full, 18 pleats. Um, and so it's not the easiest recipe to make at home. We do have the recipe on our blog. Um, another recipe you might consider trying, which is I think just as good um, and perhaps a little bit easier is the pan fried version of that. So mm -hmm. that is called uh, sheng jian bao, which is basically the wrapper is a little bit thicker, so it's easier to work with. Um, the filling is, is very similar, um, but because the wrapper is thicker, you it's a little bit more forgiving, and then you pan fry them, um, and it still has tons of delicious soup inside, um, and maybe that's my favorite, actually, over the regular version. Wow, okay. Um, but I would recommend trying that one. Uh, so first. how do you how do you how do you spell that so people can? Um, sure, you know. it's uh, S. I can actually just type it right oh, in here. Perfect. So that everybody... Cool. Thank you. Um, and then um, oh, perfect. Nice. Um, so okay, so lunar lunar New Year is coming up, and it will be the year of the ox um, in February. And I'm wondering how your family and you personally celebrate, I assume cooking might be involved. Um, how, do you, how do you celebrate? What do you make? What could we make at home that would be cool um, by way of celebration? So um, on our blog, we actually have this uh, Chinese New Year, like art, this article where we have a menu for every skill level. So we have like the easy menu, the intermediate, and then the advanced. Um, so that could be a, a good place to start. Um, basically, the, the foods that are served around Chinese New Year are all pretty deeply symbolic. So Chinese New Year is all about um, sort of ushering in as much prosperity as you possibly can. So it's like um, you serve spring rolls because they represent uh, or because they look like little gold ingots or gold bars, and that represents wealth and prosperity for the new year. You have, um, like my mom, we just blogged a recipe for literally, they're called like money bag dumplings because they literally look like little money bags. <laughs> um, and what are they filled uh, with? They're filled with so money. My mom did a, yeah, my mom did a, a really tasty vegetable filling. So it was uh, dried shiitake mushrooms, carrots, and bamboo shoots. Um, and then she tied the little bags with like blanched cilantro stems. Oh, no. Nice. <laughs> a very, uh, I mean, it's that's also, you know, a Chinese New Year thing is like these dishes that take a lot of effort um, mm -hmm. and that are a little bit special. Um, and then I, I think that there are foods that represent like wholeness or like uh, togetherness um, or unity, like things like um, serving a whole chicken, um, like head and feet and all, um, gotta have the whole chicken. Uh, and then uh, dishes like, um, or there are also just traditions like serving um, two fish and then saving one for the next day uh, to represent like surplus or like having, um, having surplus in the new year or like uh, basically excess. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, while we are, you know, we're having smaller gatherings this year or no gatherings at all, I think that uh, something important to remember is that in China, um, Chinese New Year is actually called the Spring Festival. Uh, and the festival lasts for uh, 15 days. So it's like a two week long celebration. Um, and, and in China, obviously it's the, the biggest holiday of the year and people go back home, like they travel far and wide to go back home to their home villages. And so mm -hmm. it really is like a very extended celebration. So I think this year we're gonna be thinking of it that way as well. Um, so even though we're, we have like smaller, a smaller group, it's just going to be like our small family bubble. Um, 
we can sort of spread all of those dishes that we want to make over that two week period um, and sort of, uh, yeah, spread it out so that we don't uh, miss out on any of those dishes that we, we make every year. So just, just so we can get a picture of like, we, you know, those of us who are interested in such things have been reading forever about like, okay, these are the foods and like whole fish and all, all of these different things. And, um, but like, if, if you're not Chinese American or Chinese, um, it's like, we can only wonder, cause I've never read about this anywhere. I don't think like, at what point during the day do you eat them? Do you eat them all together? Like, how does it like actually play out? Like not during COVID, but in a normal year in your household? Like, what would it, like, is there, is there a bigger celebration on the first day for on the first evening? Or right. First day? Like, right. How, do, how does that work? So I would say there aren't like the rules aren't like strict or anything like that, but I will say that um, you have the Chinese new year Eve dinner. So it's called in Chinese Nian Nye Fan. And I think, uh, and, um, it basically is, uh, for us and our family, it is the biggest dinner. Um, so it's like, so this year, Chinese new year falls on February 12th. So we would uh, have that dinner on the night, the evening of the 11th. Um, and usually what we, uh, what we do is, it, it is our biggest dinner. So the, the two fish are there, the whole chicken is there. We usually make a soup because there always has to be a soup. Um, what kind of what kind of soup would you would you have? So it, it changes every year. Um, but I think uh, the one that shows up the most is uh, it's called Yan Du Xian, which is basically um, it's a Shanghainese style soup made with like salted pork and bamboo shoots and um, tofu knots. <laughs> this mm -hmm. might be getting a little bit too esoteric, but um, it's basically like tofu sheets that are rolled and then tied into little knots. And it's just like a, it's a textural thing of like enjoying a different shape of tofu. Um, but uh, that is a, a Shanghainese classic soup. Um, and so my mom likes to make that um, every, most years. Um, and then there are things like uh, we usually have like some kind of braised pork dish. So you would have um, either like a braised pork belly. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there are basically tons of things that you can do. I think if you look under like the meat section of our Chinese New Year uh, menu planning guide, like most of like a lot of it is pork belly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my mom actually did a recipe of uh, braised pork belly with dry preserved mustard greens this mm -hmm. year, which doesn't Maybe it doesn't sound like the most enticing thing to an American ear, but like it, it is truly <laughs> delicious. It sounds, it sounds great. great. So, um, okay. So let's see, Juliet um, dropped, oh, you did. Okay. So that, so yeah. that's the soup that, that's the, the um, salted pork and bamboo shoot and tofu knot soup that um, Sarah mentioned. So there's the recipe for it. That's great. And yeah, I love the preserved green story on um, the walks of life. It's so cool. And it sounds great with like any, to me, anything with preserved green sounds fantastic. Preserved mustard greens. Um, okay. So, so you're, so, so new year's, new year's Eve, you've got the two fish, the whole chicken. Braised oh pork. yes. I didn't finish. Right. Um, so that they're the biggest dinners on new year's. Um, the next day, like in like in the morning for brunch, we probably would have like some of the like uh, a nian gao, which is like a sweet uh, rice cake that um, you basically make the rice cake, you steam it, and then you can slice it and pan fry it. And it's it's uh, made with glutinous rice flour, so it's like pretty sticky and um, and sweet. It's almost like mochi uh, in texture. Um, so we would have that probably, uh, around breakfast time. And then maybe at lunch, we make something else that's special. Like, uh, we would fry some spring rolls or we would do, um, I don't know, like dumplings for lunch. Dumplings are, are very traditional for Chinese new year. Um, and then we would have another big dinner on oh <laughs> new God, year's it's day. Like a lot of cooking. Yes, it is a lot of cooking, but it's it's kind of that time where everybody is together. So everybody is helping. And it's like that time, like the cooking in the kitchen. It's like Thanksgiving. 
Mm -hmm. the cooking in the kitchen in the kitchen is that time to be together um and to spend together and is it sort of like a two-week thanksgiving less so here i find um like when when we celebrate it's usually those two days um and then uh the next big celebration would be the lantern festival which falls on the 15th day of the year so this year i think it that means it's on the 26th um and that uh is basically sort of um the traditional food to have on that holiday is uh, tang yuan, which are these like glutinous rice balls, uh, usually filled with like a black sesame filling or peanut mm -hmm. filling. Um, they're also savory versions. Um, so, and, and that kind of marks the end of the, the spring festival. Okay, cool. So um, just one more follow-up question about that New Year's Eve when you have the two fish and the whole chicken and the pork belly and the soup. Is there, um, are there some greens also served or? Yes, yes. My mom would never let us uh, have a dinner without vegetables. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there are also a lot of vegetable dishes. So um, one of the, the ones that has kind of come back into our consciousness recently is called uh, Rui Tai, which is basically translates to like, as you wish vegetables it's like it's like the name of the dish kind of says like oh may all your wishes come true kind of like a kind of a, a meaning um and it's a, a dish of soybean sprouts and um and leafy greens uh i think my mom uses like a tot soy or it's like a, a particular like a it looks similar to like a curly baby bok choy mm -hmm. um but you could use like, you could use regular baby bok choy, you could use regular bok choy to make it. Um, and then uh, there are also like, veg they're actually vegetarian dishes. So um, we just posted a recipe today for um, uh, suya, which is a vegetarian duck. <laughs> um, it, it like when you slice it, it literally looks like little pieces of roast duck, um, but it is actually, uh, bean curd sheets uh, rolled around um, a vegetable filling, um, similar to that money bag filling um, of mushrooms, carrots, and uh, bamboo shoots. Uh, obviously you can change up the filling and, and use whatever you like, but um, it's also really delicious. Uh, you kind of just make the bean curd roll, you pan fry them, you braise them, and then you slice them. <laughs> um, so great. Yeah, they're, they're super, super tasty. If you've ever had like the bean curd rolls at dim sum, they're a mm -hmm. little bit similar. Um, okay, great. So, um, and don't worry everybody because we will collect all of these recipes, um, dishes that Sarah mentioned and we'll send a follow-up email with links to all of them. So that way you'll be able to find them. Um, so, um, okay, cool. So there's something, this is like super personal that I wanna ask you about, but like me personal, but um, it has to do with a soup that I grew up with in those Cantonese restaurants in Southern California. And, you know, when I grew up, just like I believed Los Angeles was the center of the universe, I thought that everybody in the world must be able to enjoy this kind of soup, which was called war wonton soup. So then when I grew up a little bit and moved to New York and, and so war wonton soup is, it's like a, 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 a big bowl of wonton soup with tons of stuff in it besides wonton. So there's like sliced, um, sliced roast pork, there's um, chicken, there's shrimp, there's vegetables, um, snow peas always, um, water chestnuts, like all kinds of things like that in it. And it's like, it's really like a meal in a bowl. And, and it was like, it was always one of my very favorite things. And if I was by myself, I would just get an order of that and that would be my dinner. And it's so good. So, um, you know, I always sort of assumed it was like a very like Chinese, you know, Americanized Chinese, um, dish. But then when I moved to New York, it didn't exist in any restaurants. And at some point I found like, and from the research I've done, and you'll tell me if this is right or wrong, I think war means like everything or all or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then I found like sub gum wonton soup that you could find occasionally in New York. But then I really learned that wonton soup just 
in most parts of the country in Chinese American restaurants, wonton soup is just, it's, it's clear chicken soup just with wontons in it. So right. is that right? Is it, do you think it's like only an LA thing or only a California thing or only a West coast thing? Or like, have you heard about it? Like, what do you, what do you think about it? So I think, um, I mean, so some restaurants put like little shredded bits of the roast pork in, in the wonton soup, but you're right. It is mostly just a clear, a clear broth with wontons in it, maybe a few scallions. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's a really interesting, uh, an interesting question. And one that we um, have kind of grappled with ourselves of like, you know, all of these regional Chinese American dishes that either we hadn't heard of or that we realized were, you know, very specific to one part of this country. Um, and while I haven't- say, So you're talking about Chi regional Chinese American, not regional Chinese. Exactly, right? regional Chinese American. Um, so things like, like war wonton soup. I had, I live, I grew up in New Jersey uh, in the Northeast. I had never heard of it. Um, until a Walks of Life reader requested it. And I was like, war, wonton soup. I was like, what is that? And I had to look it up. And then I saw, I was like, oh, it is exactly what you described. It's wonton soup, but it has lots of other stuff in it. Um, and so I think, um, and then, you know, we would draw parallels to that where it's kind of like, oh, it's almost like a sizzling rice soup, which also has a bunch of other stuff in it. Uh, but instead of, like a lot of the same things that you mentioned, like roast pork, chicken, shrimp, and like vegetables and all that. Um, and so I think that it's been super interesting for us as a family to kind of like draw these lines between different dishes and, and try to figure out um, what part of the country they, they originate in, because there are a lot of things that we did not uh, grow up with or that we are not familiar with, even as a family who used to run a Chinese restaurant. Um, and I think that that's been super interesting. I, I can't say whether war wonton soup is only a California thing or a West Coast thing, because honestly, I'm not sure. I've actually been thinking of doing kind of like a walks of life reader survey where I could like, where we could like map these dishes in some okay. way or like, say, like, have you ever heard of this and where are you from? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know what the best way to do that would be, but um, I, I've been thinking about something like that so that we can figure out like exactly, you know, it's basically what group of immigrants created that that dish or, mm -hmm. you know, invented it uh, for the local clientele. And I, I think that it's a, it's a super interesting thing that, um, that we've also been learning about over the, the course of uh, running this blog. So it, it, it raises a, it, another question, which is, is Chinese American cooking, like, is it a legit thing? I mean, we're talking about regional Chinese Amer American cooking. So like, how is it? Um, how do you feel about that? Um, as a Chinese American person? Like, is it, you know, is, is it legit? Is it something worth sort of chronicling? Is it like, how do you feel about it? Yeah. Um, so I think that our, this is a great question. And I, I think um, basically where we've landed on it is, I, I think that Chinese American cooking has long been um, sort of denigrated or, or cast aside as like an inauthentic and like not representative of like quote unquote real Chinese food. And while that is kind of correct, I mean, it is a very different cuisine from anything you would find in China. Um, I, I don't think that that means that it is invalid in any way. I think that it is its own thing. It's its own sort of cultural cuisine and it has its own heritage. Um, and I think that it's also worth preserving. Um, and I think that that is the stance that we took when we first started the blog is, um, our family had that heritage of, of cooking these dishes, uh, particularly my dad, uh, with his father. And, um, and so we didn't want to discount that. And while I think that there are questions of whether, you know, whether, uh, a blog that puts out, um, shrimp with lobster sauce and beef and broccoli can also put out, uh, you know, 
grandma's home cooking kind of Chinese dishes and then also things like soup dumplings is was definitely something we thought about. Um, but I think that the different people have different entry points into Chinese cuisine. Um, Chinese food means different things to different people depending on where you grew up, uh, you know, the access that you might have had uh, to that cuisine. And so, you know, we wanted to create uh, a blog that really spoke to all of those different perspectives, mm -hmm. um, not just because, not just to like help our readers, but also because, you know, we feel that every single one of those uh, lenses on, on Chinese cooking and Chinese food is is important and uh, is worth preserving. So um, I also think that, you know, when it comes to Chinese takeout food in particular, uh, I like it. I really love eating it. Um, and I'm a Chinese, I'm a Chinese person. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I might get flack for saying that. But like, if you have Chinese takeout dishes that are done really well, I mean, they're obviously not always done perfectly well, but if they are, they are delicious. And mm -hmm. so they are worth uh, documenting um, just as much as any other recipe. I, I think it's, um, it, it's funny because it, I think there's a sort of interesting analogy with Tex-Mex cooking. And mm -hmm. Tex-Mex, um, and you know, we've written about this at Cooks Without Borders, Tex-Mex was really like, it was born out of a really serious um, case of cultural appropriation where the um, the sort of the cultural ownership of the cooking was really taken away from the, yeah. the, um, the Mexican people who created it. And then those restaurants that came out of that really, um, it was not the Mexican people creating the menus. They might have been working in the kitchen, but they were cooking really um, you know, the, the sort of, the, the history got erased of the people who started cooking right. that way, the comida casera from, you know, San Antonio, Texas, for instance, um, that was taken away from them. And I think it, it developed into really a food for, you know, for Anglo people with right. just tons of cheese on it. And, you know, personally, I think it's just like not that delicious compared to Mexican food, but I agree with you about Chinese American food. Like I, I really love it. And, um, but it's interesting because I feel like at this moment in history, um, there are super interesting Chinese American chefs and people and cookbook authors and bloggers who have really kind of embraced it and and run with it. I mean, the, the No Moi cookbook, was just published um, from the restaurant in New York. And that's a Chinese American family. Um, and it's, you know, it's really coming out of that culture and kind of embracing it. And, but really, you know, people of Chinese heritage creating the recipes and doing the cooking and, and talking about it and owning it and getting the credit for it. So it's, it feels a little, it, that like, the whole, I think, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's a super interesting conversation to have and, and one that's full of, um, you know, nuance and, and complexity. And I, I think when you're talking about cultural appropriation in food and representation, I think that, you know, you could come at it from a lot of different angles. Um, I do think though that like the way that, um, at least from our family's perspective, maybe the, the way that we think about, uh, because, Ultimately, Chinese American food came out of immigrant families running restaurants and wanting to make the food palatable or like familiar, more familiar to an American palate. Um, and so it is that kind of like, you know, some people might call that whitewashing and look at it uh, in a negative light. But I think that it's also like, you know, it's a representation of uh, you know, work and the history of, for me personally too, like my ancestors, my grandfather who, who cooked those dishes and was, was proud of cooking those dishes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, you know, he, I, I wish he was still alive because I think that, you know, our blog would be so much rich, richer for mm -hmm. it because he just had so much knowledge um, that, uh my dad, he passed on to my dad, but obviously my dad doesn't remember every single thing, or maybe he didn't like pass on every single like tidbit of, of information, but just all of the sort of learnings and everything that um, I've personally absorbed from 
uh, recording those dishes. Uh, it's really, it's about tech. It has, there's like tons of like technique and uh, I guess know-how involved in, in making those dishes. And, and some of it is, you know, you can connect it back to uh, a more traditional style of cooking. And I think that um, it's sort of that just like through line and that like heritage that makes it easier for like a Chinese American, especially one who has family who used to uh, work in those restaurants or like cook in those restaurants. Um, easier to own that that food and kind of um, and support it and and uh, be proud of it, I guess, you know, in a way. I mean, just as like, I think that obviously what we try to do on the blog is also is, you know, maybe bring people in with that familiar stuff and then also introduce some new stuff um, or stuff that might be new to them, like things that we were eating more so at home rather than ordering from a takeout place. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, all three of those sort of lenses on Chinese food are are valid and, and that's the approach that we've taken um, to it on, on our blog so far. Fantastic. Well, Sarah, we have um, come to the end of our hour. And so um, I, I, I think I could talk to you forever. Um, uh, it's, this has been so much fun and I hope interesting to everybody. And you guys asked fantastic questions that made this wonderful. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, I think, you know, there were a couple questions that we didn't get to. Maybe you and I could follow up and, and I'll send out, you know, a little newsletter wrap up with some of the recipe links and we could answer some of those questions um, so we could be sure to get to them all. But um, thank you so much for being our guest. And it was really, really super fun and wonderful. And congratulations on all the great work you're doing at the Walks of Life. Um, I'm sure you'll see lots of, lots of um, Cooks Without Borders folks coming over there. Um, and um, thank you all for being here and, um, and um, have a great evening. Yep. Thank you, everyone. This has been awesome. And thank you, Leslie, so much for hosting. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye. See you next time.